George McCluskey, you are a Celtic icon. It was back in Hamilton on the 15th of September 1957 that George McKinley Cassidy McCluskey was born. Where on earth did that name come from? It's, uh, I'm actually George McKinley Cassidy McCluskey IV, <laughs> believe it or not. I've got a cousin and an uncle and my grandfather was the same name. That's where it came from. Uh, my dad gave me the same name as his dad, basically. So, so the Cassidy and McKinley part, is that from, you know, your ancestors? Yeah, that's off of, like, um, my grandfather's and grandfather's kind of thing. It's all a kind of Hamilton thing, you know. Uh, they're steeped in Hamilton history over there, so that's where it all came from. So there you are. But we know you, of course, as just George McCluskey. Discovering football then when you're a, when you're a young boy in, in Hamilton, was it just always there? Was it something that you were always going to do? What was your early memory of football? Well, see, to be fair, uh, I was only about three or four when I moved from, from Hamilton to Birkinshaw. And uh, my earliest memory was, well, my brother John was born two years later than me, and uh, we always played football together. And it was like straight in for school, grab a piece of jam, grab the ball and go up the park and just play to... My mother shouted at us for our dinner and then back up again and I think the same kind of story yeah. reverberated around the full of Scotland at that time, you know. It was, I remember as well when I was growing up, it was a case of getting your tea down as quickly as you could so you could get back out there. Uh, you, you were hoping you got a, a wee light tea so you could get out quicker, you know, and back out with the ball. Because uh, I remember the days, our full street was full of kind of Celtic supporters and we all used to meet up the park and and we played, uh, they call it Rondo now in the professional game, but it's just a wee keep ball. If somebody would get in the middle, and at that time there was loads of good footballers here. And if you lost the ball and went in the middle, you were there for 20 minutes, half an hour, so you didn't want to lose the ball and get in the middle. When I was, when I was growing up, when I was like, you know, 8, 9, 10, I remember you at Celtic, it was that, that team of the you know, late 70s into the early 80s. When you were that age and your kind of formative age of, of discovering football and discovering and supporting Celtic, it was the Lisbon Lions. What was that like? Oh, it was just phenomenal. Um, I knew Jinky because he, he stayed about 200 yards from my house uh, when he moved to View Park and they married Agnes and they moved to Buckingham and uh, I used to train with Jinky every every year for I was about 15. The the six weeks of the holidays uh, are the pre-season for him. Uh, we would train over in Bodwell and that, that lasted up to I was about 40. We were still really? training, still training together. A lot of people don't realise how big a trainer he was. He was absolutely fanatical about training and getting fit. I mean, we used to go over and I'd have trainers on running, heaty big tackety boots, all men's miners boots running, you know, and uh, it was just, it was just fanatical about it. And I, rem I remember one year in particular, my brother-in-law and my, my pal says, uh, I wish we could come and train, but we work in the Caterpillar. Uh, we start at eight in the morning. Junkie says, right, you can come. We'll start at five. <laughs> I used to come and get me at five in the morning, meet they too. They would train, go to the work. We would get back to our bed. So, <laughs> what did you learn? I mean, training with you. I mean, nowadays that's like a young boy growing up and training every day with Lionel Messi. I mean, what you must have learned so much from oh, him. Unbelievable the wee tricks he would teach you. But uh, I, I remember one day in particular, we, we play. We always finish with a wee game or something. He says, "I know you try and take the ball. If you're, you've got a good balance, George, to go swing to the to the left and take the ball to the right. But if he's going to put his foot there." Lift it over him. Get your foot under the ball and lift it over his foot. Jinky used to love doing that, didn't oh, he? Oh, he done that all the time. And I said, oh, so I started doing that, you know. But there was hundreds of things I could say, but that was the one that kind of stuck in my head, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, I lift it over their foot. You know, he was just a genius, as you know. Playing organised team football then, boys club, youth football, um, how much did you get involved in that? Um, my dad did a... a, a Pal and he's working in the Ravenscraig and he had a team up in Colt Ness, but it was a bit of a trek away up there, you know. And uh, so my dad and his wee pal Stan McDermott started a team called the Blantyre Red Rockets, believe it or not. And I started to play with them. And uh, they won everything, they just kept winning. And they'd, uh, they'd myself and my brother was playing um, and loads of, a lot of good players. Uh, we started winning and we went in to play Celtic Boys Club one day. And uh, we beat them about 5-1 and I scored three, I think it was. And they asked me to sign and my dad says, look, 
you as well going with them, I'm going to hold you back, you know, but I'll support you and all, the, all I can. So I ended up going to the boys' club. Was that the, was that the first time where you and your family thought, oh, this, this, you know, this boy's good? I think so. I think my dad realised it early door. He, he can realise he had two special sons, you know. Uh, my brother John was a right good player as well. Um, and I think he realised then, and uh, I think some teams are starting to take notice of us as well, you know, there's loads and loads of scouts around about that time, around about that area. And uh, in, unbeknown to me, he never mentioned any to us, you know, but I think some scouts were get, uh, speaking to my dad, you know, mm. so... That you're involved great. in the youth setup here at, at Celtic just now. You've worked with the 17s, now you're with the 18s. I mean, compare the way youth football is and the way it's organised now to the way it was back in back in your day. Is it fair to compare them? What, what, is one better than the other? It, it's not. That, that's ten times more professional now. Ten times more professional. You've got. I mean, every team will have a sports scientist, a physio. My dad was my sports scientist, my <laughs> physio, everything. You know. Uh, so it'd be unfair to. To put one up, against yeah. the other, you know, but uh, I would think it's ten times more professional now. Aye. So you're a you're a boy back then making your way, you know, boys club. But back then, on the international scene, there was the under 15s. I remember as a boy always going with my dad to see Scotland under 15s, and it was always. I mean, remember Paul McStay made his name. You That's know, right. Playing against, scoring a, in the, the the famous game against against England. But you yourself scored against England at, at Wembley, but there was something special about, about this game because your whole family could see it, because it was on TV. That's right, it was the first ever televised game uh, for the, the Schoolboy International. I'm still trying to get tapes here, I can't get it anywhere, I don't know if you guys can help me. No, I had a look on YouTube to see if I could find I it and I can't find it anywhere. I die, you can't get it. Um, but actually my school, St Catharines in View Park, didn't have a football team, they didn't have a team, so I, I wasn't eligible for the Scottish Schoolboys. So John Higgins, who was the chief scout here, went out to the, the school and asked Tommy Cassidy to start a team just to go into a cup so that I would be eligible for going to the school boys. And uh, believe it or not, uh, we got a team together and we ended up winning the cup. And uh, <laughs> Is that right? oh, it, was, it was unbelievable, man. They were... Uh, oh. There were just a load of hard guys, right? It's a tough area of you, Pat. There's a load of hard guys in the team. They just booted and kicked everybody and I scored the goal, you know? <laughs> so uh, it was brilliant. And I ended up getting picked for the Scotland thing, you know? So how did it feel that day when you're playing at Wembley against England to score the winner? Well, I, I remember, I actually remember my mum and dad, I think my mum pawned her wrist, her bracelet to get down to Wembley so that she could see us. So they two went down the train. And they were doing the train, watch the game and back up the same night. But uh, everything they had, they got to, to get out of Wembley to see me, you know. And luckily enough, uh, we beat them 4-2. And uh, I scored one for about 30 yards. So that was, I, I've still got the memory of turning around and looking up the stand. My dad's got a big pint of beer in his hand, <laughs> cheering like mad, you know. So that was one of the greatest memories of my life. When you look back, could you have had the career you, you had and... and, and you know, made the moves that you did and, and you know, become such a, an icon here at Celtic without the support of your parents. How, imp how important is it that, you know, the, the parent aspect for young footballers? It's everything. It's everything. Uh, they pick you up when you're down. They, they take you everywhere. They make sure they go without. Well, in my day, it was they went without to help me get to get on. And um, I, the sacrifices they made for me, were or me and my brother, were unbelievable. And... I don't. I didn't appreciate them to know when you look back on it how much or how hard they worked to get me where I was. You know. So tell us about the day in July 1974 when you're in the house and you get a knock at the door, and it's uh, Jock Steen and Sean Fallon standing there. That must have been a shock to the system. Oh, I'm, oh my! I've done something wrong. You know <laughs> what have I done? But uh, as you see, I'd been to Wembley. It'd be the first televised. My dad was getting phone calls for Arsenal, Man United, Chelsea, everybody was phoning. And Big Jock, being Big Jock, went, right, we're going to sign this, we're going to go out and sign him. So him and Sean appear at the door. Sean takes my dad to the pub and Big Jock stays. And I remember sitting, my mum's making soup and Big Jock's kidding on, he's interested in what she does with her soup and all that. And I was like, he's... And I remember... So, wait, so wait a minute, so Sean Fallon and Jock Steen turn up at your door 
Oh, to try and convince act. it's a double act, right? It's, it's a, a double kind, act. kind of a good cop, bad cop routine what, or something. What's that? Split and divide and a divide and conquer. The divide and conquer. That's what it is, basically. I. So Sean Fallon's the one though that takes your dad to the pub to try and convince him to let you sign for Celtic. Yeah, Why him and not Jock? Jock didn't drink. All right. Well, Jock wouldn't drink. Yeah. So Sean had liked a couple of beers and all. I think. So I think Sean drove and Jock drove away. But I, I remember Big Jock trying to get him. My mum said, "You know, trees have." George goes to Man United or Arsenal, he'll not get this soup, he'll not get this, he'll be in digs, you don't know what they'll be getting, you know, I can see my mum thinking, you know, I'm going to... But I didn't realise at the time the main games he was playing with her. Your dad was a Celtic supporter though, so surely there was no negotiation to be had? Well, I, th I think initially that was the case, but I think these people were phoning him and filling his head full of nonsense, you know, with all sorts of money or whatever, I don't know. But uh, I mean, my dad used to bring us here, me and my brother, mm -hmm. uh, when it was the old long tunnel, you remember? I, you'll know. Remember, Jerry? But it used to be a big, long, old tunnel. Right. It was about thirty yards long. Well, we used to get sat up there to watch the game, you know. And I, I, one of my first games, I still remember it. Um, Bobby Lennox knocked the boy, the Aberdeen goalkeeper's hand. He had it in his hand. He knocked it out when Runham stuck it in the net. <laughs> and I'm shouting, "I seen that! I see he's pulled that out of the guy's hand." My dad's like, "Oh, shut up! Shut up!" <laughs> Uh, the referee never seen it, the linesman never seen it. I still speak to Lennox about it today. Um, that was one of my earliest games. So how did you feel? So your dad's in the pub with Sean Fallon. Jock Steen's in the house talking to your mum about making soup. Uh -huh. But, but you, you're the one at the centre of all this and you're a boy sitting there. So how did you feel then when your dad came back to say, right, that's it, done, you've oh, signed for I Celtic? I always wanted to sign for Celtic. I didn't find I was a mummy's boy. I didn't want to go away down to England and stay there. It was a big worry for me at the time, you know, so... My dad and Sean come back arm in arm, you know. Uh, <laughs> Mum going, and there's, my dad's like, right, George, we're signing for Celtic. We'll date tonight, son. I was over the moon, you know, that was me. Happy as last. So, so literally signed the contracts Aye. in the house that day? Oh, big job produced a thing for you there, didn't they, you know? You had it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, you'll never beat that guy. So you, you, you then go from a situation where you're this young boy watching the Lisbon Lions, then you train with... Jimmy Johnson, then you, you, you arrive at Celtic as a player and you've got guys like Jinky still there, Bobby still there, Bobby Murdoch, uh, unbelievable. Billy McNeil, guys like that all still here. What was I, that? I remember, come, I used to train on a Tuesday night, it was an S form assigned, so uh, I trained on a Tuesday night and it was the old, it was a big circle there, it was all ash behind the goal and they used to play five a size here and they played two touch and it was the first time I'd ever played two touch. And it was all like uh, players that were in the periphery of the first team, you know. And uh, I never got a kick in the ball. And I remember going home greeting, running, greeting, and lying in my bed, greeting. And my dad came in, I come in for work. He was back shift. And he came in for work and come out. He said, What's up with you? I says, I can't, I'll not be a footballer. I said, What do you mean? I said, To play this game two touch, I couldn't do it. I kept taking three, I kept taking four. I couldn't control the ball. I said, they were playing around about me, I couldn't do it. I said, just don't be, it's your first time, son. Don't be so stupid. Right, the more I mean, use up that park, we'll do two touch. And me, him and their John went up the park, and two touch, and eventually got to, you know, and, and the tricky is you've got to look where the ball's going before you, you get it. You've got to have a picture in your head where you're going to do it. And uh, it was brilliant for then on. But I remember that night going, I'll never be a football player, I'll never play for Celtic. Can't even play a game. I can't get the ball off these Lisbon lines. How bad am I? Did you did you feel overawed when you first joined at Celtic? I was lucky enough that uh, we drinky the the drinky kind of thing connection, yeah. connection that uh, I knew him, so he can uh, ease that a wee bit. But you're still Bobby Murdoch, Bobby Lennox, Tommy Gamble, you know, frightening. I'm cleaning their boots when they come on the ground staff, you know, and Ken Douglas was there as well. So it was just. Mind blown. Talking the ground staff, we can see the ground staff here just uh, cleaning away at the, the seat. So you're there with these famous, famous Celtic players. And what did, was there any, what was the banter like back then? Did they do anything to help you settle? Okay, they were always giving you wee tips or all that and, and, and telling you where you're going, work harder at this or do this, you know. Uh, but it was, it was just awesome to be in their company, you know. To be, I remember one day brushing, I think it was Billy McNeil's boots. I'm rushing Billy when you're boots. He's at this time at least this time probably got one pair of boots a year. Mm. 
You know, I'm going, it might have been a bit she wore at Lisbon or whatever like that, you know, and unbelievable. And of course, back in those days, it wasn't a case maybe like it is now when you sign and it's only a matter of a couple of weeks before you're in the first team. Back then, there was a real stepping stone, wasn't there? Well, you went, the initial thing that they'd done there right away was put you out to a junior team. So you you went out there, but because of the the kind of Wembley thing and that, uh, I think Big Jock was getting loads and loads of requests for me to go there. So I actually signed for Thornywood United because they, they used to make you uh, sign for a junior team so you could get reinstated if you ever didn't make it in the thing. Me, but I never played a game for them, so it was just a matter of signing. I think they got a couple of bob for it, um, and I went straight into the reserve team. So I was playing reserve football for 16 and a half, you know. The reserve league is back here. I'm not sure it's quite the same as it was back in those days. And people look back in the reserve league fondly to say it was a great, it was great for young boys to play against, to play against men and to develop you physically, mentally, emotionally. Was that the case for you? Oh, absolutely. I, I thought it was brilliant. I think the, the difference nowadays is uh, when the first team were away, the reserve team played whoever they were playing here at Celtic Park. Yeah. So we were getting crowds of maybe a thousand people watching the game. So that kind of broke you in gently towards it, you know. And I, I think that'd be better, a better idea, although I don't think Brendan would be happy with the, the part getting played <laughs> no. on every two weeks. I think he'd gaff his head. But uh, that, that was how we played. Whatever the first team was playing, we either played at home or away uh, on the, the, the field, do you know, the, the home field. So that, that was what we were just saying, there was crowds there and it was great just the remember first first game at Celtic Park, you know, and you're going, right, it's empty, but my God, I'm on Celtic Park, you know, brilliant. And of course, back then, you know, it wasn't just you, there were a lot of other youngsters and that, that was when you struck up a, a great friendship that was, to, that was to last a lifetime with Tommy Burns. That's right, uh, he'd been on the ground stuff about six months, he was a year older than me, uh, although he tells you 11 months, he'll say 11 months. Uh, but he was on the ground staff when I came, and the ground staff at that, that time was oh, it was ruthless, absolutely. They, they hit you with everything, you know, all the old the apprentice things, you know, going for a left-handed screwdriver to get them balls. It just every day it was something different, you know. It was some education to come, and he was the worst. He just took a enemy, and we went for fighting to with a, bo a boxing match one day to becoming best pals, you know. <laughs> So you, you, you were kind of seen, you know, you were from Birkinshaw, you were kind of seen as a, the boy for the sticks, the boy for the country, and here's Tommy, typical uh, streetwise East uh, End boy for the Carlton. Oh, uh, he's a wee toony, you know, it knows everything, you know, comes for the Carlton, you everything. I'm the kind of country bumpkin, and uh, he just took a enemy. And we ended up, it came to blows, the trees were rolling about one day up at Barfield, and uh, ever since then, we've been best of pals. Yeah, and of course, you, you struck up not just a great friendship, but a great partnership on the pitch as well, because he, he assisted you with a lot of your goals as well. Was there something that, that, that worked for the two of you on the pitch? I, do, I don't know if there's any truth in it, but there was something telepathic. I knew when he got the ball, if his body moved in one direction, I should run another way. It, it seems silly, but there was something in it. I mean, there's a, there's a goal that we scored there. Uh, I th we won the league against St Martin. I scored two. Yep. Uh, and he gets the ball and he goes on. I said, I know what he's putting us. I know exactly where he's putting it. And I make the run, he puts it in front of me and I stick it in the net. So it was telepathic, or maybe it was just with his body movement, I could tell where he was going to put the ball, you know. But uh, I, he, he created a lot of goals for me. Now you talk about, you know, playing here for the first time as a boy and, you know, empty stadium or not many people here, but you're thinking, wow. But you, f you don't remember your actual debut for the first team, is that right? I have no clue. I cannot remember that. Somebody, Dixie Deans keeps telling me I remember that. I says, uh, Valour, It was against Valour, the Icelandic team. I have no memory of it whatsoever. None, none. I don't know what it is. I still can't even picture the strip, what like the strip was or anything. I have no memory of it whatsoever. Well, it was against Valour, and it was the the game. It was the the, the game here. It was a, a, you know, ended up you thrashed them, and you came on as a substitute in the second half. I'm just reminding you because you don't I remember know, it. You've got no recollection of it. It must be Pat McCluskey. Is it? <laughs> no, well, Pat McCluskey was playing. Oh, the two McCluskeys. Ah, yeah, but also. he started the game, but you came on. I no? cannot remember. I have no memory of it whatsoever. 
it's incredible, isn't it? So your memory is actually of making your debut against against Rangers. Yeah, exactly. I against John Gregg. He was playing left mm-hmm. back. That's my memory. I've no recollection of the Valour game whatsoever. But let me take you back then to that because that was your first start. Was against was against Rangers. So there you are. You're. I mean, for a start, was that a surprise when your team get your name get read out? Absolutely. The the, the team were going through a bad period at the time. Big Jock was in the hospital. If I remember correctly, after crash. the car crash, um, and they get beat one nothing in the League Cup final the week before, and there was a pool of fifteen, and my name was at the bottom of the, the pool, and I was there to get the boots in, get the towels in after the game, and blah blah blah. The next week, it's the same pool, exact same pool, and I'm still on the bottom. And uh, this, we go go to the game as usual, blah, blah and I'm sitting, I'm thinking, right, I better. Better run and get their towels and get their boot, go and get their boots soon as he finishes talking here, you know, Sean was and I went and kind of said, What are you doing? I'll go and get your boots. He says, Did you hear the team? I went, No, what? He says, You're playing. He says, That's right, don't he says, I swear to God, you're playing. And I went, Sean, the see at with me. He went, No son, you're playing. A terrible accent. <laughs> <laughs> no son. Uh, there's a common thread here. You, did, you didn't remember you'd made your debut no, before that, and then you didn't know you were in the team. I didn't know. Are you sure you were all there? Uh, yeah, I don't think I was. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be like that. Celtic. Um, so there was no chance to be frightened or scared or anything like that. You know, it was, it was just uh, another game, and uh, it was, I'm playing outside right. John Gregg at that time had moved from centre half to left back, so I'm playing against John Gregg my first game. Wow. You know, and uh, just amazing, you know. Um, I remember, remember him coming to me before the game, I'm going to break your leg, I'm going to break your leg. And I went, you'll not catch me, you're too old now. You're far too old, you'll not catch me. But after the game he came straight to me and he went, George, well done son. He said, that was brilliant. He said, you're going to get a lot of that because you're so young. He mm. said, you're going to get a lot of players telling you. He said, but you handled it well, well done. Well, yeah. I admire him for that. Aye, the other aspect, well, John, John Gregg's a legend, no matter what team you support. The other aspect of that game, which again, you must have been feeling pressure. I know you're young, so you maybe don't feel pressure as much. But your first start against Rangers, and you're playing number seven. I know. The famous number seven shots. I'm the only one that, uh, seven restaurants, it's not got my photo out there. <laughs> oh, we need to sort that out. We need to get that sorted. Um, aye, unbelievable, wearing junky. After training with junky for so long, wearing these shorts, it was frightening, absolutely frightening. It's frightening when you look back. At the time, you were you were a young boy. You were take the world on. You know, you weren't scared of nothing. Yeah. You, you you scored over fifty goals for the club, but you were known for scoring important goals. You came up with the with the big goals. The goal against you know the goals were ten men won the league. Here, the, the, the goal against Ajax that, that, that won the tie, the goal against Real Madrid here. What was it about, or was there something about George McCluskey that was just always there in the big occasion? I always loved the big occasion. I always loved to play in the big occasion. Um, and I think it brought the best out of me. You know, when I think when I get put under pressure, I perform better, if that makes any mm-hmm. sense. Um, I, I don't know, I, I think it's about what many goals. Uh, I think it's nearly 55, 60 league goals, and yeah. Paul Curry says it's about 90 goals on. In total, yeah. Aye. Uh, so, I, I just, but as you say, out of the 90 goals, there's a right few mm. very, very important goals in there, which. And of very, course, I didn't mention the cup final one in 1980. I mean, what? Very you, proud of them all. Yeah, what's your favourite one when you look back? Uh, obviously, the, the, the cup finals, mm. massive. You've scored against Rangers in the cup final. Um, but I think to score against Real Madrid, get the winner against Ajax away from home, it was the first time they'd won for ages, for the Lions I think, they'd won away from home. And of course they won at the 10 men won the league, uh, I love that. I th- it's hard to pick Jerry honestly, um, probably the most important was the cup final, I would think. 1980 uh, cup final. I would think so. Yeah. Uh, I was looking back in the pictures. Uh, from that and of course everybody remembers what happened in the aftermath and the police horses coming on and all that and and what's forgotten is that crazy silly hat you were wearing when you went up to collect the, your medal what was all that about? Uh, somebody came on and stuck that in my head and I remember It was about three feet tall uh, I remember uh, a copper grabbing me going George go off the park go off the park and I, 
Oh, come on, man, let's celebrate. Give us a break. Wait, George got off the park. She says, Oh, because you're a Ranger supporter, you're putting me off the park. That's ridiculous. He said, George, look behind you. And I went, Thanks, officer, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> get me out of here. <laughs> I said, Thanks, officer, get me out of here. And he shoved me up the tunnel. I, could, I don't know who that guy was, but I must thank him. So, it was OK Corral, wasn't it? And of course, you it's your goal. I mean, you are the one to blame, if you want to call it that, for the fact you can't get a drink at football now. That's it. It's terrible. Everybody, everywhere I go, especially guys in my dad's generation, we can't get a pint of the game now because of you. It's all your fault, you know. So <laughs> They need to bring that. You've got to go. Celtic love me for it because they'll give me a job in hospitality and that's how you get a drink now. You've got to buy hospitality and get a drink exactly. now. So it's one goal that in one game that I remember, I was I think I was I was eight, I must have been eight at the time in the 1980 Cup final, and I remember as a young boy just getting started to come and see Celtic and watch them, and watching my dad and his and his brothers just go absolutely crazy at, at, at this goal that was scored. It's one goal that that kind of started my love for football. But the big question I've always wanted to ask you is, did you mean it? Absolutely, 100%. I meant it, but. When Jack, Danny Shaw at the bus came straight for me, and I think it was about 114 minutes or something, we were goose, and you've done it a million times up the part, the bus came, you hit it with outside your boot and it spins. Um, but when I'd done it, I went, ah, I've not got enough on that. I was trying to put it away into the far corner. As soon as I hit it, I went, ah, I've not got enough on that. And I turned around, but big Peter McCloy was away, to the right hand side of his goal. And when I got, I said, that's got a wee chance. And it hit the deck and spun right over him. Now, obviously, I went completely crazy, but initially when I hit it, I went, I've not got enough on it. Mm. I've not got enough spin on it. But when I turned around, Big Peter came away out here for some reason. And uh, the ball turned, spun, and then uh, obviously the rest is history, you know. And Has Danny, what's, what's the, been the chat between you and Danny at the time and since then? Does he still call it a deflection? Danny was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I remember in one of his interviews right after the game, he said, I, George and I have practised that all week. <laughs> <laughs> I went, I'm going to use that. <laughs> that was brilliant. Straight off the training uh, ground. So we've been at it all week, too, as he said, we've been trying that all week. Uh, but he's still trying to claim it. But Danny McGreen hitting a shot on target is just a no-no, isn't it? <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> what a player he was, though. Let's not oh. criticise Danny McGrain. Oh, he could hit a target, a target with a tackle, but no a target on on the goal. Another big goal you scored. You mentioned the one in the one in Ajax, but I'm more interested about how you managed to get Johan Cruyff's jersey after the game, and then Aye. subsequently what happened to it. Oh, poor John Stoll. To this day, he's still in limbo. Um, well, I went into their dressing room, right round, and went round every one and every one of them was doing like, no, no, I'm no cheer, I'm no swan. Actually, it's European Cup, you've just no, put, aye, we've put them out. Johan oh, Cruyff's total football team out. Aye, absolutely. Oh, big, a lot of them went on to be massive names, they, Man United players, Mulby and all that, yeah. Liverpool. And uh, everyone said no. So I went, ah, stuffies, and I went to go to the door. <laughs> and uh, I heard McCluskey, McCluskey, I went, I'll, I'll swap with you. And Johan Cruyff's on the... Uh, the rub bench and he's smoking away like a lint. He hunts his fag to the, <laughs> the masseur, takes the jersey off, smokes him, he shakes my hand. And uh, I was like, stuff the rest. <laughs> I've got a mean man here, you know, and they're all doing, I'm going to get him out of here. Uh, so I got, that's how I got it, you know, unbelievable. Uh, he shouted at me. And he went, great goal. I'm just picturing Johan Cruyff getting a massage and the hands the fag to the master. <laughs> he did hand the fag to the master to take a jersey off. Unbelievable. So you took it home and you put it in a frame and you put it up on your wall and it's still there having played a place in your mantelpiece, George? No, no, really. Um, our John was playing five or six the next day and he says, can I? I said, don't touch it. I'm telling you, don't touch it. And he says, ah. so he decides to wash it. At that time, we had a wee sister, Teresa. So we'd, the, the older people and the young ones will not remember this, but it was a coal fire and a big giant guard to get around the fire, keep the wind back. He put the jersey or the guard to dry at the fire, burnt it to a crisp. Burnt it to a crisp. We ain't forgot all about it, burnt it to a crisp. I'm not kidding you, this is gospel truth to you. About five months ago, a guy phoned me. <laughs> he said, uh, I got your number for so and so, do you still have Christ jersey? I went, no, what, what it says, I've got a collector willing to pay 25 grand for it. No way. <laughs> Honest to God, I was like, um, no, I've not got it anymore, you know. 25,000 uh, pounds. Guy phoned me, I don't know who he was out the blue, how he got my number. He got my number for Celtic Park somewhere. And I collect. it wasn't for him, it was a collector who was prepared to pay. 
Incredible. Nah, it's just story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> who were the when you look back in your, your your time at Celtic, who are the teammates that we mentioned Tommy Burns, who who are the other teammates that stand out for you? Oh, I think uh, see that time, uh, we were a very close team. Big team. We got to the quarter final of the European Cup. And we were cheated over in Madrid. Cheated over Madrid. We were never going to, I missed a chance, I must admit, but even if I'd have scored that, they'd, they'd have got something else. The f first 30 seconds of the game, somebody can hit Bobby Lance up here. He never even get booked. Never even get booked. We were never going to win that game. It, it, was, uh, it was corrupt at that time, if you ask me. Mm. Um, we were never going to be allowed to win. But we got, to the, we got so close to it. We were a very, very close team. Um, David Proven was was pal of uh, like Tommy and I, and it was really a really close close group of guys. Big Tommy McAdam and all that. And then of course Big Roy comes and and people like that. There know. were always leaders about always. the team at that time, wasn't there? Aye, uh, there was. There was see the the thing you were talking about earlier with Tommy with the the kind of wide off of the turn. You yeah, know, yeah. there was loads of them in our team. I don't think we've got that nowadays. You know, like the, the line said we Betty and Jinky and Tommy Gale and we had our guys and all and Tommy and um, like Danny and Murdo and people like that. They were all widows as well. Johnny Doyle, know? of course, as well. Doyle. Doyle was a pure widow, eh? <laughs> a pure widow, <laughs> as they say in Glasgow. But in 1983, then you left Celtic for Leeds. Disappointed at the time. When you left? I was scunnered, I had to go. I was scunnered. Um, I was on the lowest wages here. And I, I'd asked, uh, just make me up. And then Big Billy left and Davy Hay came in. Davy Hay was fantastic for me. He tried his best, but it was Desmond White was the chairman. And I was on £180 a week here when I left. My dad was in the Ravens career getting 150 He was top goal scorer in your country. Mm. Wouldn't it happen nowadays? No, 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 absolutely not. Wouldn't it happen nowadays? And I asked, I think your top wage was £300. And I says, I want 300 and I'm not signing. And they come up with 200 210 mm -hmm. 220 And, and Legion A came in and I spoke to Eddie Gray and Eddie was fantastic. We Jimmy Lumsden was with him. And they offered me £500 a week. Too big to turn down. Oh, it, was, it broke my heart. Because they weren't in the top flight then, were they? No, Leeds? they weren't even on the second division. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely broke my heart, but I couldn't. Even. I'd got to think of my family. Because the board at that time weren't thinking about me or my family. So I had to think about them. That broke my heart to go. Let, let me talk about then after, when you come back up, because we're getting close to the end. When you come back up then, and you know, you, you're you talking about being a big game player and being involved in the big moments, there's, there's one moment in Scottish football, and I know you don't like too much uh, talking about it but I kind of have to if we're talking about your career and it's that you know the infamous Graham Soonis tackle you signed for Hibs it's your first game it's your uh -huh. debut for Hibs it's his first game for Rangers you get in the middle of the melee and you feel that ow what's that down the back of my leg and that's the big fallacy about this this tackle for Soonis it wasn't a tackle I didn't even have the ball I was arguing with the referee there's about two or three Rangers players behind me and then he's behind them again and he's kind of stuck his leg between them and caught me just, my leg was that tight. He's caught me and just cut my leg. So it, it wasn't a sore tackle or anything. It was just a slice because my leg, the back of my leg was so tight. Are you saying it was an accident? No, I'm saying he meant it. He meant to do it, but it wasn't a tackle. Mm. It wasn't a tackle, but he sneaked behind two, other, two or three other areas. If you see, watch it again. Mm. I'm arguing with the referee because I think he's booted somebody. And well, BD, the tackle was on BD, wasn't BD, it? BD, Stuart BD, Stuart BD. So it was I. And he's got up, and I'm arguing, but there's two or three Rangers players behind me still. So he's got to kick through them to get to me for some reason. I don't know why. Absolute madness. But as I say, the only thing that bothered me, it didn't, it was a cut that took me longer to get back than anything. There was no injury mm. as such. It was just a cut, you know. But I still this day, I don't know if there was something sharp in his boot or whatever. But my leg was that tense. But it was just a wee flick out like that, you know. The, the fallacy is that tackle soon as hidden you, there wasn't a tackle. Aye. That's a kick. It's a sneaky, it's a a sneaky, sneaky kick. kick. Aye, that's all it was, really.
And you could see when you were going off the pitch, the look of sort of surprise in your face as if to say, what, what, what did you do that for? Uh, he's trying to apologise, you know, and I'm saying, you're maniac, you. <laughs> you know, he's... You spoken to him about it since? I've never seen him since, no, I've never spoken to him. Mm. He tried to get into the dressing room to apologise. Obviously, moment of madness he's done. Mm. But we had a wee guy, Jackie, who was like, running the dressing room and that, he chased him with a brush and went, like, Mr McCluskey doesn't want to speak to you. Wee <laughs> Jackie's leather and I'm with a brush. Brilliant. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I just let that picture oh, sink in. Brilliant. Um, to finish up, though, I mean, you you, you then signed for for Tommy at at Kilmarnock. How 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 pleasing was that was that for you to not only be there with your one of your great pals, but but to help him in, in promotion and getting Kilmarnock well, back I, to the top. I think I think that's what what it was to help him. Um, I just get released with Hamill for some reason. Uh, I was a top goal scorer and they released me. I couldn't could you understand that? But he was at my, my door that uh, phoned right away. He says, right, need you, and then he comes up to the house and uh, he says, listen, just new in management. My first signing's got to be really important. So I want you to sign for us. So I was virtually his first signing as a manager, you know. So um, this is a funny story about that. He came to my house, uh, got me to sign the things, and he was going up to see old Jimmy Steele at the hospital in Lark Hall. After he left me, and Rosemary phones me about one o'clock in the morning, have you seen Tommy? I went, he's going to lap call. Don't know what's happened. Two o'clock in the morning, she phones me, oh, he's back in the house. I say, what happened? You know, on the M74, and didn't he stop to Carlisle? He missed his turn off. Just missed his turn off and kept going to Carlisle. <laughs> and just him and young Jonathan were in the car. And he's went to Carlisle, about turned straight at him, never seen Steely. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. sums him up, doesn't it? Do you miss him? Oh, badly, aye. Badly. Just yeah. even a blather. Yeah. Just a blather, aye. I watched the, the programme the other night and to walk out the room. <laughs> it's sore. It's still sore. Well, listen, George, you had a great career here at Celtic. It's great to see you back. I'm sure yeah, the youngsters at the club are, are making the most of your, your valuable experience and your, and your insight, but you will forever be a Celtic icon. Thanks very much, yeah. Pleasure.